Welcome back to My Life in Seven Charms, where today I'm joined by Peony Lim, creative director, content creator and brand consultant. Peony is one of the original influencers. Drawing on her time studying fashion promotion and then art history at the Courtauld Institute, she created a blog that changed not only her life, but the way in which we are influenced by tastemakers. It is so familiar now that it's easy to forget that it's been a huge and fast revolution, and she was there at the forefront. Peony began her first blog in November 2010, and after only a month, she secured her first contract and has gone on to create content for the world's most prestigious luxury brands, including Chanel and Hermes. Since then, she has become one of the UK's leading and most recognisable luxury lifestyle content creators. I'm so looking forward to finding out more about the person behind the content, exploring her personal stories and experiences through her chosen charms. Welcome, Peony. Oh, thank you for having me. So it's going to be uh, interesting um, talking about your charms because actually what you gave me was kind of lots of ideas about what the memories were, but you weren't very specific about what the charm should be. So I've imagined what I think the charm should be. So do feel free to say, I hadn't imagined it like that or, you know. I mean, maybe that comes from my kind of art history background that I think it's so important to be collaborative and like to see someone's creative process come to kind of full fruition so I think it's really exciting to see how you interpret the thing that means something to me well let's start with the first one so your um uh, the first one was uh, I've designed it as a bowl of pasta with tuna and olives inside it it's a three-dimensional bowl made of white gold. It's got blue sapphires uh, embellishing the bowl in kind of dots. Yellow gold fusilli pasta inside it. And then little black diamonds sprinkled on top of the, the pasta, which I see as the olives. And then small little brown diamonds, which would be as if the tuna was cooked and it, we could engrave something really gorgeous on the bottom of the bowl but perhaps we can come back to that once you've um once you've explained to me why I've designed this bowl with <laughs> that tuna um, pasta I think when you remember kind of life-defining moments from your childhood often it's the small things isn't it it's yeah. that stay with you that are the kind of the love and the shaping of of your childhood and my mother was incredible she was very hands-on and very loving and um, she is a fantastic cook and I have vivid memories of us in our first home sitting on the kind of back steps out to the garden we had a whole kind of team of dachshunds and it was (laughs) me and all these dachshunds on the back doorstep and I don't know why this is the dish that I always remember from my childhood and weirdly I don't think I said to you um, that it was fusilli pasta but that is what I remember her cooking it of all the pastas, which is so bizarre that, that? That, you, that you chose that. that so is, how serendipitous is that? That is so bizarre. Um, but just tell yeah. me, so where was this townhouse? Where were you brought up? It was, it was in Cornwall. In Cornwall? Yeah, it was in Cornwall. And um, we, we, as children or as kind of young children, we traveled the world with our parents and um, lived in Asia and America and then kind of came back to school in England and lived in in this townhouse with my grandmother and my mother predominantly my father worked abroad and sitting in the back doorstep of it eating these this olive and tuna pasta and which I still make for my kids now do you yeah do they, it's a real do you put the food. olives in it yeah they love olives they love capers as well yeah so was it happy childhood it was very happy yeah it was very happy and and very loved. You, are you one of how many I'm one of two yeah it was very happy well, when you say um you lived abroad did you live abroad for extensive extensive time yeah so um we lived in New York and in um Malaysia and um it was only really kind of when we needed to go to school that we settled back in England because your mother's English my mother's English exactly yeah father's my father's Chinese Chinese okay um so was your mother was she was she educated in England is that why you yeah both my parents were okay yeah but she'd grown up in Cornwall so was food particularly important or just this particular dish that was that was I think food is important in general in my life because it's where we nurture it's where we bridge the cultural gap I think a yeah. lot of my cultural experiences with my father are based around food and I think cooking is an expression of love yeah 
well, particularly in Asian cultures, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, my mum always says that um, Chinese people will say, are you hungry before they say, are you okay? Yeah. So do you cook a bit of uh, Chinese food? That, yeah, I that... do, yeah. I'm, I'm quite passionate about keeping that kind of side of my family culture alive for my kids because obviously I've married a white man and so it's kind of all diluting a little bit yeah um but I'm it's really important to me and I'm delighted that my daughter's favorite food is dumplings that's a real labor of love making dumplings it is but they obviously love they love doing anything like that your next job I absolutely love doing this job uh so this is a bathtub filled with bubbles <laughs> um so as you can see, this I've drawn this as a kind of slightly old-fashioned Victorian bath made of yellow gold. It's got feet. Um, and on to, so the, the outside of the bath is yellow gold. Uh, and then the bubbles are all in white gold with the odd little diamond set into where the light catches the bubble. Um, and it's a locket, actually, so you can put something inside it. And in order that you can open it easily, I've put just a little aquamarine um, Briole drop on the bottom um, so that it moves nicely. But other than the fact that it's it would be the most divine charm, why a bath? I mean, it's like joyfully whimsical, this charm, isn't it? In my childhood, I was very, very close to my aunt, my mother's sister, who's um, passed away now. She died of cancer when we were children, but she was like a second mother. We were extremely close to her. Did she live with you? Um, she did during the phase of dying of cancer yeah. but, and um, we were very very close to her and one of my kind of happiest memories with her was doing bath time with her she would play this game with us where she'd wrap us up and I, I play it with my daughter now but she would wrap us up in the towel and pat the towel as if we were a parcel from the postman <laughs> and then we would emerge from the towel and pretend to be whatever animal or whatever thing we were coming out of the parcel as um, oh, and no. it was just she was a relationship that I had that was completely unadulterated love and compassion. She was so um, kind. I've never met anyone as compassionate and kind as she was. That She had this incredible way of um, being on your side without polarising the other person. Yeah. She was a true diplomat. So you could be crying and saying, oh, mummy's told me off and it's so awful to her. And she'd make you feel better without making my mum seem worse. And that's, that's a gift. That's a skill. That's a it? proper skill. Yeah. She was your mother's sister. Yeah. yeah. Well, she'd be very thrilled, I'm sure, that you, you've remembered her in this incredibly kind of nostalgic way, I guess. Um, so your next charm, um, you, you said to me, boarding school. So I know a little bit about why um, why I've drawn this particular charm, um, but just for the for the listeners, um, this charm is like a miniature book. It's also it's a locket. It's got old fashioned kind of binding on the back. It's got a border of blue sapphires, um, and it's got a little orange sapphire cross in the middle. I think it would be adorable. It's it's hinged. You could put a little photograph, little notes inside it. Um, but w tell me in your own words why why I've drawn this. Um, as previously described, I had a very happy childhood at home and um, lots of pets. And so when it came to go to boarding school, I think I thought, you know, well, why would one want to leave that situation? And it was it was one of those things that was kind of never discussed in our family it was just kind of an accepted norm that you would go at what age I went at 11 was it an all-girls school it was an all-girls school yeah it was a shock to be separated from my home and my my mother for the first time I think and she'd sent me off with this family prayer book which is a paperback and funnily enough has a blue cover and so it took me a good year to settle in and then I was fantastically happy at school and my best friends are from school still to this day but the thing that I found comfort in during those phases was this prayer book because I found it very difficult to get to sleep on my own in the dorm rooms everyone else would be asleep I'd be the last one awake and it was like this awful thing to be the last one awake and still missing home. And I would look for prayers in the book that were about being homesick, which obviously there were no prayers about that. So I try, have to try and find the closest thing. Interpretation. In, yeah, closest interpretation <laughs> in the prayer book. And I still have the prayer book. And it reminds me so much of that kind of seeking of comfort in your loneliness. And you said you've got lots of friends from school. 
my best friend is from school and yeah there's like a group of us that are still still in touch yeah that's uh that's that's such a special thing it's hard i think to to get from a from a day school I yeah i think, I think it's so kind of not, it's difficult but to i mean some of it that. is also kind of luck of the draw that you end up living near each other or you know your yes, lives course, parallel yeah. And, yeah. yeah um now your next charm um is is really an important life moment for you now i've drawn this as a spiral notepad um because I'm obviously a lot older than you. <laughs> so um, I've drawn it as that because to represent, obviously, um, blogging. It's a spiral notepad um, that the, how do you describe those? The springs that round it, round the, which, which are basically the binding, um, keep the pages together, are yellow gold. Um, and then uh, it's, a, it's a lined um, book with many, with many pages. Um, all engraved with little lines on them for the for the, um, the, the in a ruled book, um, and it's just got blog written on the top of it. Um, but I suspect that's not quite how you started. <laughs> Again, I think it's so funny how the natural symbiosis can happen in this creative process. So my first blog was on a platform called Blogspot it came with set templates which were all very ugly and kind of clunky um and I had a friend who was quite good at coding and so I drew in a spiral notepad oh you're joking (laughs) with little labels you you know the little small luggage labels that are about kind of centimeter square I drew my name in kind of a you know handwritten font on those labels hanging down from a spiral notepad um and that was like the original homepage. Oh, God, that's so, uh, isn't that weird that is so weird so weird um and so yeah that was that was my first blog and um I actually had a shared blog as a student with with two other people and that was my first kind of foray into blogging and I didn't read any blogs and so it I think I came to it in this very great innocence of just doing what I wanted to do without any influence from what I thought should be happening online um, which was very freeing. So when about six months later, I decided I wanted to do one on my own because I wanted to be able to put whatever I wanted up without having to ask two other people. Um, and that was kind of the main reason I started on my own was just so that I had creative freedom. And it was literally just for me to share things that I liked. So you studied at the Courthold. Yep. What did so you... I was still a student there. Yeah. So um, we're in 2010, are we? The end of 2009, beginning of 2010. Okay. Um, and I was in my second and third year of university and it was just at the beginning of kind of street style photography. Um, and so it was that that very beginning phase where you started to see in like the Sunday supplements or like Grazia photos of what, what people were wearing in real life kind of thing Yeah, in that Bill Cunningham kind of way. Yeah, And, um, they would take my picture as a student, you know, just what I wore as a student, um, I was nobody. And um, well, hang on, what, what kind of things were you wearing? I mean, I look back now and I'm like, there was a lot, there was a lot of energy going in at that phase. <laughs> I was wearing, um, do you know the um, Hatter Mary Mercier from I know Paris? Who you mean. I know who you mean. Yeah, yeah, so I had one of her cat hats in black felt. So I would wear that with a um, very heavy black cashmere coat from a liar that has you know the kind of Big traditional pockets. fluted mm-hmm. um skirt and then you know sort of black tights and black platform prada boots it was a whole you know a I was, there was a black. lot happening in those days it was a lot of i always wore heels without fail I always, wore heels. always wore heels as a student i was not i was the opposite of a grungy student it was pristine and always in heels so i'd been to art school before i went to university and I think I'd kind of had my grungy phase yeah. at art school yeah. and come out the other side and realised that wasn't the life for me and I wanted um, something a bit more a bit different. More sophisticated. And um, so, yeah, so there I was um, on the Strand, always toting high heels. And I, I'm one of my best university friends. When the first time he saw me in flats, he was like, oh, my gosh, you're so short. You've never <laughs> seen me in flats. You'd you know, always see me four inches taller. So and he and he was over six foot. So I think it came as a bit of a shock. So, okay, so that's um, what you, that was so that's the, what, that yeah, was the so look. Yeah, so it was very, you know, I used to wear a lot of kind of chiffon prairie bra- blouses with like high-waisted jeans and kind of very 
tailored cowboy boots and yeah i mean the whole thing was very put together it was yeah yeah, it was i would still wear all those clothes but i probably don't have that much energy anymore so let's just going back to the beginning of the blog so you you're thinking okay i'm going to sit down i'm going to write this blog so what were you thinking was going to happen so obviously now with an entire industry built around it it's hard to imagine that you might create something for pleasure of course and for no possible material benefit but you know i was young I was a student. I had the arrogance of youth that, you know, I discovered everything for the first time. And I think I was just in that really kind of energetic, joyful space of youth where you have so much to share and say and you want to find a community. And that was really all it was about. It was about saying, I love this film, didn't you too? Wouldn't you love to dress like her? Wouldn't you love to read this magazine or wear this outfit or travel to this place? And that was it, what it was about. Who at that point was going to be reading that. So I think I was quite strategic. So when I had the blog with the two other people um, and photographers would take our picture, we would always give them like a little printout of our blog name so that they credited back to our blog name. So even though we were like nobody, we were getting the hits off these much bigger sites coming back because they were crediting us. That is so and I'm obviously so in those days, no one was doing that. But I think we were like, all doing an academic degree and quite like <laughs> too much time on our hands so it seemed like a sensible thing rather than spelling your name 12 times because there were three of us you know to just kind of cut out these little they were like little um like fingers like that they were small yeah. you know they weren't like the size of a business card i mean genius so when in I retrospect set, genius. i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean quite pushy yeah. but there Great we go genius. <laughs> um when i set up my own blog obviously i was able to just link from our blog across to that okay. and it okay. i think it's hard to estimate the level of loyalty and interest that we people had in us in the early days. You know, it was a, such a cult movement that people really cared and, and loved your aesthetic and were invested to comment and follow you. And, you know, you religiously, I have friends now in the industry who said to me every Monday, Wednesday, because I then, when I set up my blog, I strategized my post to publish the same days that Netta Porter uploaded. Very, and so, yes, and right. they said they would always check my blog and then check Netta Porter. And we all did because the styling was so good on Netta Porter at that time. You know, Natalie Massonet absolutely nailed the styling in those days. So you kind of would think, oh, how am I going to wear wide leg jeans? And then you'd look at the wide leg jeans on Netta Porter and how they'd been styled. And so I still have friends that say that to me. So, so yeah so it was it, there were lots of small things I did I guess like that that just seemed to make sense to me it wasn't it, it sounds very shrewd now but it, it wasn't it just seemed logical that you would have your kind of online day that you would check in with yeah. those things but it's quite interesting isn't it because because when you're running your own business or running your own you you tend to behave the way that you want to want to find things or discover things or the way that you behave and therefore right. therefore it's incredibly authentic but I guess so, we were shaping digital behavior at that time yeah and yeah. Netaporter was like the pioneer of that so it made sense to ally yourself to what was Expert. ultimately the biggest space yes yeah so having started it then what happened <laughs> so uh, so I kind of had the one with the other two people and then I set up mine and a month later I got an email. What was from, the blog called? What was it called? I set peonylim.blogspot up. Yeah. And a month later, I had my first contract. So, so and that was the summer that I graduated. So I'd kind of decided that I was going to take the summer off and party and have a wonderful yeah. time. And I set up this blog as my like entertainment. And a month, a month in, I had emails. And at the time, all of the jobs came from America. The UK was very behind no, digitally. So, okay, it all sounds really normal to you, but I, actually, <laughs> can you just say I had my first contract, kind of rather, you know, relaxed. So, so what so does I, that mean? So I received an email at the time. the The job was from Revlon, and it came from I think Condé Nast. It was for like an advertorial in one of the Condé Nast sites and and right. magazines. I think maybe Glamour. I got you know sent a commission of what what I needed to shoot and submit for it. And it all felt super alien and they sent through the photo release and I can remember reading it and thinking, well, they're never going to negotiate with me. So I better just, whatever it says, I have to sign it. You were presumably delighted. (laughs) 
and you know in perpetuity is always written there in small somewhere isn't it um and then I had a photographer friend come over and shoot it and it was all it had to all be kind of like juicy so there was like me with a watermelon or like me with ice cream it was all kind of soft pinks yeah and I look at the photos now I still have the photos <laughs> and I look so young I look like a baby um and the photographer that did it with me was is amazing she's an amazing photographer and so the photos are still beautiful um but it's it is like looking at a photo of a child you casually talk about Revlon but how did they actually find you I I honestly don't know but I suspect by that time I'd already been featured in Vogue and the Telegraph and you know all kinds of classic media outlets um so I think they were just looking for like I assume they were just looking for kind of fresh talent and and that's how maybe English as opposed to American and you know now you you see the fashion week pictures and it's and it's thousands of people attending and we don't know who most of them are but then I was one of five girls globally that were recognizable on that scene which is it's wild when you think about it like that but it was yeah under 10 people you could recognize I know it's very hard to go back but were you kind of amazed of how this happened or did you just take it all in your stride? No, because you're looking at it now as the industry that it is today yes. and the millions, billions that go into that. But it wasn't that then. You know, what, what, were, what were you there to be really proud of? Like, it was super exciting to have your picture in the paper and be shot by, because it was fueled by your respect for the photographers and their eye, because that's what drove that at the beginning. It was Scott Schumann, Tommy Tong, Vanessa Jackman, you know, and it was they were the tastemakers that decided who was worth photographing. Right. So it was hugely flattering if you were within that scene to be photographed by those people. And that's what you drove for more than the mainstream media coverage. And that's so interesting. And how did, were they friends of yours, those photographers? Did you go out and find them? Were they the people standing outside? They were the people standing outside the show. So no, I didn't know anybody in the industry in a kind of friends and family way. Yeah. It was completely cold turkey. They just saw me and then you start chatting and, yeah. So interesting. So, so tell me a bit about that because obviously that was 2010. How's it all changed? How has content creation changed since you began? I, I not expect you to give me 13 years worth of change, <laughs> but, but a little bit of kind of how it's evolved. I think the the best ways that it's evolved is that it's created an industry where broadly women are paid more than men um, and there is something for everyone. It's changed in the worst ways possible in that previously it represented mostly minority groups and we've now created a replica of mainstream media where ultimately white blonde females are held at the highest still, value. Still. Yeah, still, which is depressing. That is depressing if that's not if that's not changing quite rapidly. Um, I d- I'm not sure it will for some time actually. So and, uh, another kind of probably slightly silly question, but at what point on the journey did you realise that you could monetize it and actually it could become a kind of proper business as opposed because I think people think oh influencers just get given you know right. They get given this and that, and they take a nice photograph. I think people, yeah. some people do think that. Um, For sure. Other people definitely don't. But I'm just kind of interested when, at what point you kind of thought, hmm. I think probably the thing that's most unusual about my career is that there wasn't an amateur period in which I didn't work. Right. Um, most people had a blog as a hobby. Yeah. And then they had um, a mainstream job, like as a stylist assistant or... Um, as a photographer's assistant or whatever. Um, and I didn't. I, like I said, had a contract from the first month, yeah. um, which was during the summer that I graduated. And I worked full time on my blog from that moment onwards. And I had contracts back to back from that point onwards. And when it was, so it's a full time contract, but were you contracted just to one, to Revlon yeah. or whoever it was? And yeah, so just... I would, you know, it was it, they were each month it was new jobs from new clients. Right. Um, but I worked consistently from that point. Um, and I think that I was very lucky that I was able to do that um, financially and opportunity wise. Yes. I think I was very lucky. Yeah. And could you do kind of beauty one week 
accessories the next week, fashion the next week? So the funny thing is, even though my first job was with Revlon, I actually didn't used to cover beauty. Beauty is probably one of the more recent categories that I've covered in that I've covered it for sort of seven years, whereas fashion was from the very beginning, travel was from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, so I most of my clients in the early days were fashion brands. But Revlon was definitely beauty. Yeah, but it? Revlon was beauty, which yeah. is, yeah, so it's so, the anomaly. But, so Revlon came first and then fashion came next. Yeah. Um, and at what point um, did Chanel find you? The two brands that kind of found me the earliest were Chanel and Hermes. Um, and probably oh, because nice. I wore them. Start at the top. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Yeah. And I remember my kind of first interaction with both of them that was not as a consumer, that was kind of as a creator. Um, and with Chanel, I did a shoot of Sunday Times and... Um, they had a installation at Harrods at the time, Chanel, and they shot us in this installation. Um, and that was kind of, yeah, Chanel had chosen girls that they thought were like the young digital space for, right. for them, and I was one of them. Yeah. And Hermes, I went to um, a scarf exhibition they had, and the then PR came, came out of the event as I left and kind of chased me down the road and was like, you're peony, aren't you? And that was kind of how we met. And she was very, she was very forward thinking because it wasn't, you know, specifically for French brands. It was, you know, it was a lot for them to kind of jump into that space. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and also kind of interesting at that point that they were happy to pay, I presume, at that point. So I think different brands kind of approached it differently. And yeah. some brands were very eager to pay from the beginning and then pulled back massively. Yeah. And then other brands kind of weren't willing to pay until it was kind of proved and tested and, and yeah. then played a lot. So I think it, we've been on a journey with how things are paid. How do you feel about that, that kind of authenticity piece when most people know that most influencers are paid or gifted or whatever? So, so how does that play with authenticity and value to the client to the consumer? So I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for no, myself. Course, yeah. um, and I've always voted, focused on luxury. Um, and so it's been quite easy to filter out the product that is not relevant to my audience because I'm focused on that specific side of the market. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to communicate about high street brands yeah because that's not my remit and that's not to say there isn't value there it's just not my specific space yeah um and i will always refer readers that have that interest or or, or have questions around that market to someone else that i rate who talks about that market i think the most successful moments in my life have come out of a quiet confidence of not caring what anyone else was doing and just staying in my lane and just focusing on what I was doing. And actually having kids has been the most challenging thing to that. Um, and kind of reshaping who you are as a woman after you've had children has been the thing that's rocked that the most for me. But my success is definitely when I'm able to stay in my lane. So Penny, your next charm, um, you'll be, I'm sure you won't be expecting this, but you basically said you wanted something that was going to remind you of when your husband proposed to you in Cornwall. Yeah. yeah. So it's a cassette. Um, it is exactly a miniature of what you'd expect a cassette to be. So the little holes in the middle, you could put your pen in and they will turn. Um, and it's got engraved on it, Katie Mellower. And on the back, um, it has got nine million bicycles um it's also got a little red garnet heart um a little carved red garnet heart which we have i've put onto the cassette um and it's in it's in black rhodium um on white gold um and it will work absolutely perfectly but i've obviously given you a hint but can you just tell me how did your husband propose um, so my parents have a house in Cornwall and um, we often walk to the beach and go to beaches that you can only access by foot or by boat. And um, we were down for a bank holiday and I was utterly in love with my husband. He's the love of my life. 
And um, although I was desperate for him to propose, I didn't have any idea that it might happen, which How sounds weird. Not very long, right. like just over a year. Okay. So, you know, it wasn't that long. Um, and so I didn't go thinking this is going to be the moment at all. I didn't, I wasn't existing in that space. And um, he said to me, oh, let's go to the beach. I want to get pebbles to go on the top of my plant you know, my bay tree in London. So let's go and pick some pebbles off the beach. And so I said to my family, oh, let's all go to the beach. And he was like, no, 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 no. we're just going alone. <laughs> they politely refused. So they politely refused <laughs> yeah. and off we went to the beach alone. Um, and it's a very steep incline onto this beach. We've actually not taken our children because it's not very child friendly. You have to kind of clamber down this kind of little slip that you would only know if you knew it. Yeah. And we got down there and realized the tide was very far in which means that you can get cut off on the beach. Ooh. And so I said to him, oh, we're going to have to be really quick because we can't tell if the tide's going in or coming out. If it's going in, we'll get stuck. So we need to get grab the pebbles and go <laughs> kind of thing. So we ran across the beach and, you know, bring the pebbles. And I was really trying to, you know, I'm such a perfectionist. I was like looking for the purple, perfect black ones or white vein <laughs> ones. And um, he was further down the beach from me. And he said, um, oh, come look at this pebble. It's so, look at this pebble. It's so amazing. And I was like, look, we've not got time for this. Tide's coming in. Yeah. Quick, just, you can show me when we get home. He was like, come and look at this pebble with me now. <laughs> so very reluctantly, I went down the beach to look at the pebble. And there was a little heart-shaped kind of polished marble pebble on top of the beach. And I was like, ah, you're so cute. Obviously knowing that he'd put the pebble there. But no part of me thought that there, this was an engagement, which is actually just quite worryingly stupid of me. Um, and I lifted up the um, a heart pebble and underneath was the ring. That ring? That ring. Yeah. That ring? Which is extremely dirty. Um, yes, that ring that covered in nappy cream. Um, <laughs> and I, to this day, I think that was quite brave of him to put that on mm. incoming waters. Yeah. As it turned out, the tide was going out. So we actually had lots of time on the beach, but we didn't know that at the time. <laughs> And, and he knelt down and proposed and I can't remember what he said and he can't remember what he said. And um, I remember thinking that I, although I thought I wanted him to propose, you don't really know what the answer is going to be until you're asked. And it kind of just comes out like a knee jerk reaction. It's like a physical response. Mm -hmm. You just say whatever. I don't even remember what I said, but it was obviously yes. Piers? No, I don't think so just kind of complete overwhelming it was like as he proposed the life that we might have kind of surged before my eyes it was like this big rush and then we we lay on the beach and talked about the life that we wanted together afterwards and I think I'm so earnest as you might have told from the catholic prayer book that I took to school <laughs> um that I took marriage I do take marriage very seriously and as does he and it wasn't something that either of us went into thinking, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. No, we kind of went into it thinking, yeah, this is life. forever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I did worry afterwards when we got back to London that, you know, although I loved him, was this, you know, it was going to shape the rest. I was aware of how it was going to shape the rest of my life. And was that, was this the right choice? Even though I loved him, you know, was I blinkered by the fact you know, we'd all had relationships before and you'd lusted after someone or loved them even and it hadn't been right. So was this the one that was going to be the test of time? And I was walking down that long strip of pavement that takes you to South Ken Tube. Anyone who knows it, it kind of runs along the side of the platform and listening to music. And On your Walkman? It was, I'm afraid I was a little bit older, so it was on my iPhone. <laughs> okay, yes. um, and, it, and it was like, a. it must have been like a random spotify or apple music kind of playlist where yeah. it serves you music that's random um because i don't remember listening to this song or owning it before um and this song came on which is um nine million bicycles and by katie melia and the lyric is um basically that she knows that she'll love him more than anyone like the fact i will love you till i die yeah and i thought that that was how i felt about him and ultimately it wasn't about how he felt about me, it was about how I felt about him. And that was how I felt about him. Oh, I think that's such a romantic story. How many years have you been married now? We, oh, I'm so bad, I never remember when we got married. Yeah, We've been really together bad. like eight or something years. And we were married like after two, I think it was two years we got married. So did, how old were you when you got married? I was 29. Okay. 
and then so I guess it's six years coming up it's so. six years do you remember your anniversaries out of interest yes because we met on Valentine's Day so it's easy so you met but did you get engaged did you get married on Valentine's Day no but we got we, we share our wedding anniversary with my parents so it's very easy to remember that one. Oh, okay okay I really struggle with it. Why I have to race down to get the post in one of my in-laws who sent us a card. I mean, how <laughs> pathetic is that? No, but I don't. We don't really celebrate that one. Um, not yet, but maybe yeah, you maybe, will. Maybe. maybe you will. Maybe. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I actually had a, a vintage Rolex. I gave my husband as his wedding present, and it's engraved in my handwriting on the back with the date and so whenever he's not sure we take it off and check. check is it is marriage what you thought it would be oh my gosh um I think my marriage is different than most of the other marriages I've ever witnessed in what respect we really we really love each other we're really happy and that sounds awful but I don't think all marriages are easy and we definitely have challenges but they're not about being happy or loving each other so neatly on to your next charm, uh, or charms actually, because I I have I've designed these as two little girls, um, and they're like miniature, they're little miniature girl um, little dolls. Um, they're both wearing skirts. Um, one's wearing a pink a skirt made of pink pavé sapphires, and the other one's wearing a skirt made of blue pavé sapphires. Um, their little legs wobble, uh, their arms move so they can hold hands. Um, and they've got different coloured hair. One's got dark hair, one's got blonde hair. Dark hair will be made of black rhodium and the blonde hair will be yellow gold, um, beautifully textured. Um, now, obviously, these are your two gorgeous girls. Um, so tell me, tell me a little bit about what having your first child what was all that you know how did that make you feel because it's we're not we're not trained for this <laughs> we definitely they don't come with a manual do no, they? they do not um I think me and my husband were very united in the desire to have a family and that to get married was really about wanting a family so I was not um a woman that was focused on being a bride I was a woman that was focused on being a mother and a wife right and um, so it was a dream come true to be fortunate enough to naturally conceive and carry and birth my own child. Um, and being so close to my mother, I think it was hugely exciting to have the experience of having that relationship from the other side. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, but did you find out what no the baby was no I didn't so the first was a surprise and the second we found out partly so that we could tell our eldest what was coming right um so we've had both experiences we've had the surprise and the and and the knowledge how about you did you find out for yours well it's interesting you said that about that relationship with your mother because my, my I had a very strong relationship with my mother and I was so desperate to have a girl in order that I yeah. could replicate that yeah that I did find out for my first one actually yeah um so I could get used to if it yeah. wasn't a girl and yeah. then she was a girl so I was very lucky yeah <laughs> I wanted a girl so much also um that I think I'd convinced myself that I was having a boy so I found it quite strange when they then held up a baby girl um and it was uh, i i it sounds odd now but i remember almost having to kind of learn to kiss her and the first time i kind of kissed her on the head and was like in my head is this what you're meant to do is this okay is it okay to do this kind of thing and we and we brought her home and my mum was kind of walking around the kitchen with her and rocking her and it was it was literally see monkey do monkey I vividly remember watching my mother and being like oh that's what you do and that's the noise you make and that's how you move your body it was you know it was that basic we didn't grow up with um with the eldest of cousins so we didn't grow up with lots of other children around us you know our children were the first children and um it it was a shock for sure it was a shock and um was the pregnancy, was it all straightforward, easy? No, I'm a horrible pregnant person and I'm a horrible birther, so I'm definitely done now. Okay. Um, they have siblings, so they're fine now. Um, and, yeah, I know it was a wildly unpleasant experience that um, 
thank God, the it's end done. result is worth yeah, it. Absolutely. Now, am I right in thinking um, that she wasn't quite what you thought she was going to look like when she came out? She, I had, was completely convinced. My husband's dark. I'm obviously dark and mixed race. And I thought that Asian genetic would be so dominant, dark eyes, dark hair, that... Yeah that's what they would look like, that they would look like me. And I don't know, I guess there's a vanity to all of us that expects our child to come out and be just a <laughs> miniaturised version of yeah. ourselves. which given how self-critical we all are of ourselves, it's extraordinary that we want to create something else just like us. Um, but there it is. And I thought that that's what would happen. And she came out and she doesn't look really, or she didn't then at all like me. She's fair and... She's blonde. Um, and she doesn't, she? she hasn't got my husband's colouring either. So it was really, yeah... It was it, that was so shocking to me. Um, whereas her sister came out looking extremely Chinese and has now faded into looking a lot less so. But when I held my eldest for the first time, I, it was like a shock. Like I had never met that child before, and I didn't know that child, and it was kind of such a new experience, which I suppose was also linked to being a mother for the first time. Yeah. And the second time round, when I held my second for the first time, it was like I'd met her before. Oh, really? Yeah, I, it was like I already knew her. And I don't know whether she looked, that... She looked, she had dark hair. Yeah, I don't like... know whether that was to do with how she looked or just being more experienced as a second-time yeah, mum. Relaxed, you kind maybe. of Yeah, I think yeah. it was a mix, probably. Oh, amazing. Um, so, Penny, how, what happens now? So now you've got two. Um, one's still quite little. Yeah. They're both still quite little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah so how school. are you managing... Everyone wants to know this. How do you manage to balance work mummy, wife, right. and all well, the other things. Balance is an illusion, isn't it? Yes, yes. Absolutely, there is no balance. <laughs> Let go of the idea that there will be any balance. In my experience, I'm sure there are better women out there than me that are doing it better than I am. But in my experience, there is no balance. And some weeks are better than others. And sometimes it swings the way you want it to. And sometimes it doesn't. And but do you have work days and mummy days? Or? I try to. Um, so I try and work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, which obviously COVID has made much more doable. Thank yeah. you, COVID. Yeah. One of the few perks for women. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, quite realistic in my industry to not be at a meetings and events on Mondays and Fridays because there are very few on Monday and Friday anyway. So that's that's lucky. Um, so I'm with them on those days. Um, but really, you know, look, the reality of being a working mum, and I'm, I'm sure this is not only my experience of it. I say I work three days a week. I work five or six days a week, but it's spread across seven days. It's not Monday to Friday. Yeah. And so does it feel, do you, I mean, do you love what you do? I do still love what I do. And I'm very grateful for having a job that plays to my natural skill sets that doesn't feel laborious. Right. Um, but I love my children more. Yeah. But it's that ever, ever kind of balancing act. So you have to, you have a bit of help, I presume, when you're yep. trying to work. Um, um, it's never right, is it, though? Because when you get back from work, you think, oh, my God, I should have come back two hours ago. Yep. But when you're working, you think, oh, no, I should just finish this. And you know, it's One of, one of my hard. husband's sisters said to me when I was pregnant, when I told her I would still be working, she said, just so you know, and she works you'll always feel like you should be in the other place. Yeah. Just don't expect it to feel comfortable because it doesn't. And it was such sage advice. And, you know, it's something you don't really want to hear and is not necessarily palatable, but it's yeah, I think universally it, true. I think it's universal. Every working mother might, probably must say that. I'm sure that's right. Now, um, I wanted to ask you, to, because it must be quite tricky, because actually you are... You, you know, you've got a big Instagram following, you are recognised. Um, how how do you deal with that now you've got children? Um, you know, kind of keeping your privacy, but also I'm guessing people want to know a bit about you and your lifestyle and your children. How do you deal with that? I've always been um, very frank with my readership about um, where I'm setting boundaries and for what reason. I've um, they're all highly intelligent, well-educated, yeah. you know, women. They don't, they don't need patronising. They can just hear the truth. Um, and that's what I've always given them. So when I, when I was pregnant, I sat down with my husband and we decided where the boundary was. And I, once I had the child, I explained in, in content to my followers where that boundary was. So for us, we don't share names and we don't share faces. 
And I have no judgment about other people who choose to. I think you have to do what is, feels right for you and your family and everyone's situation is different and where you live. And there are lots of factors that influence yeah. what's safe and, and um, right for your family. Yeah. I live in a city and I never wanted a situation where a stranger could shout my child's name and they would turn around. God, yeah, no, you certainly don't want that. Yeah. Um, but that's the reality, right? If yeah. it's out there and if yeah. you live in a city, there's lots of people to be able to do yeah, it. Course, so yeah. um, that that was where my line was. I guess it'll get increasingly hard as they get older and you do want to share family as as far as as far as you can, family kind of moments. I mean without showing their faces. I you? never shared about my family before I had children. Right. Um so you know, my parents don't appear in my content. Yeah. Um, so I think because I've had that grounding of understanding that it's not everybody's choice because it's my choice, um, it's been easier to, and, and it's not been something that my followers have expected from me. Um, and, and look, there's wins and there's losers to it. People feel more engaged and more attached to you, the more you share with them and you can't take back what you have shared. Yeah, so they then feel a right to that information in that side of your life. So maybe I would have more followers if I had shared more. Maybe I would feel less safe if I had shared more. You know, there's, and maybe I wouldn't. It, it, you've just got to do what feels right to you. But it's so interesting. And be you, consistent. You've clearly been that consistent, yeah. true to what feels right for you all the way along. So it's a, a huge admiration for that. Mm, I don't know. I think <laughs> whenever I've wanted to post pictures, because obviously when you have a yeah, new you're baby, proud, you're so <laughs> proud, you're desperate to share. Yeah. Um, but I've always kind of asked myself, but, for what reason? Because ultimately it always came down in my mind to seeking validation over something that I don't need validating. I don't need the world to tell me that that's the most beautiful baby in the world because I already think it is, yeah. <laughs> yes. right? So yeah. I think sometimes you have to check the reason why you post anything yeah, no, no, and be honest with yourself about what that's about. That's so interesting. And also you've educated your followers to not expect that, as you say. So, But I mean, it's, it's I think content so quickly digested and disposed of now that it's easy for things to be meaningless but we are creating a landscape that affects all of our mental health because it's so prevalent and it's so absorbed constantly that actually everything that you put out does make a difference in a small way because it's setting a tone and, set and creating trends that traverse all the platforms so you know, every time you post a picture of yourself in a fitness class or eating fast food or, you know, using a filter, it's saying something about society. And maybe I'm more attuned to it because of my mixed race experiences, but I feel very strongly about respecting other women and not creating a norm that I don't want pushed on me. That's so interesting. So if you think that, that your experience having come from a mixed race family has really affected how you put out content how you I think it's made me more sensitive to the ways that it's possible to passively absorb media in ways that are not reflective of who you are and it create a value system inside you yeah that is pervasive so you know I grew up with no um mass media figures that represented my family and what my family looked like yeah and that you know especially into adulthood is very challenging in terms of your view of race and identity and and value in the world so i'm equally aware that in saying every time you use a filter and don't disclose it or use a filter at all you're setting a beauty standard that's unrealistic that's creating a value in someone else yeah that's very challenging so i try not to perform any of those I don't know social media ticks that I am aware will create negative paths for other people well, that's so that's so interesting because you kind of as a consumer you kind of think a bit path of you know everybody's doing it you think they are so it's rather refreshing to that not everybody is <laughs> I mean know. ultimately like it's two seconds of your day yes. Yeah. And it's and that's as much as we're told that over and over, it's so hard to really drill that in. It isn't reality. It's a window into a moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, how much time do you spend yourself on, on social, social media? media? 
Okay, so this is probably like one of the weirder things about me. Um, other than my friends on social media, so there's obviously creators who are my friends in yeah. real life. Um, but other than them, all of the other creators that I follow are muted. Um, so I only absorb their content when I search them. They don't appear in my general feed. Okay. Um, harking back to the blogger days yeah. when you would actively log onto a website yeah. and be aware that you were absorbing that content in the same way that you are aware that you are actively opening a magazine or reading a book or watching yeah. a film. Um, and I, I didn't like the lack of control that the algorithms, as they were played with more and more by bigger social media companies, were serving me content and influencing me and affecting my taste predominantly more than like my mental health or you know whatever it was affecting my purchasing and like the value that I put onto different brands and things and I ended up wanting products that were not my taste at all because I'd just been served it so many times that it made me think that I needed it um so in an attempt to kind of claw back creative possession yes um I mute everyone and then I choose to view so I'll quite often go through someone's feed kind of at the end of the month and I'll like you know, all in one go kind of thing in an attempt to be much more conscious about how I absorb so content. So you're not scrolling Instagram like... like so I like... still follow, like, news outlets or, like, Architectural Digest or, yeah. you know, brands or things like that. So, of course, there's a, a there's bit. an element of, like... And, and also the feeds are now served, serving us content that we don't follow anyway. Yeah. So listen, it's not fail safe, yeah. but it's a way to manage, particularly in a market where there's so many of us doing the same thing, mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm not passively copying or absorbing someone else's content yeah. without realizing and then, em yeah, and then yeah. emulating it without yeah. realizing. Yeah. Um, it's a way to try and keep my difference. God, it's quite, that's quite a challenge in itself, I would have thought, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know, what I love in terms of content creation, I love being in the country because you are less exposed to um, product and you're more focused on aesthetic. Yeah. And, and that's very helpful. So I love having my breaks in the country all through my pregnancy because it was during COVID, my second pregnancy. Um, I split my time 50 50 between, yeah, between Cornwall. Cornwall and London. So I spent two weeks of the month every month in Cornwall. And that was just to isolate contacts with COVID yeah. and being pregnant. Um, but it was massively beneficial for me creatively to have that time to digest and internalize a little bit. I think we're so um, constantly overstimulated, aren't we, at the moment that it's it's oh, it's, it's hard to like. Yeah, that's why I wondered how seek much your time voice, isn't it? Like, oh my goodness! And are you? I probably should know the answer to this, but I don't know. Are you on TikTok? Are you on all of those things? So I have TikTok, but I think I must be one of the few people in the world that finds TikTok uninteresting. Yeah. So you and me are like I I look at the feed and I don't care. It doesn't, you know. I know friends who can like lose three hours on TikTok kind of thing. I ten minutes and I'm like, yeah. it doesn't interest me. And what it and the things that interest me on it that it serves me are in no way aesthetic. You know, it it almost fills the gap of kind of how to mm, how to or kind of reruns of interviews it's much more like watching tv and you yeah. know how one would yeah. kind of scan through channels it's much more like that isn't it yeah it's, it's yeah. not the place that i would seek inspiration whereas i think instagram at its best was almost like going to a gallery you know you could find the new artist that you loved or the yeah. new woodworker that you loved yeah. or you know it it was a hub of creativity at one point and i think it's lost its way more recently but it it was a wonderful source i mean i think pinterest still is well, and I you know love pinterest. pinterest is a platform that is it's very difficult to monetize but it is where you build your dreams isn't it, it it's where you plan is, your life but you can literally lose yourself down yeah. the rabbit hole for yeah. hours can't you so, yeah. yeah so so your last charm um i've kind of i've kind of i've drawn this as a birkin bag as a little miniature gorgeous brown hermes birkin bag um, that, that it opens, um, it's absolutely as you'd expect, handles move, um, and it's got a, a engraved inside your name just because I think that you've probably got a Birkin bag. I know you've got a Birkin bag because I've seen it on Instagram. Um, but I guess this represents all of your luxury experience um, and 
and kind of I, I'm kind of interested to know how how do you go about making content do you kind of have to strategize it and kind of put time aside how, how does that how does that work because I think people think that content is an Instagram picture right. you know is a picture on an iPhone off you go thanks very much <laughs> I, I think there's this idea, isn't there, that content just kind of produces itself. Yes. That it's this very organic process yes. in the way that your camera roll fills up. People think that that That's is a hop, yeah, yeah, skip and jump from yeah. content. And it could not be further <laughs> from that process, sadly. Um, I think when I was younger and I had more time, it was possible to kind of create in a more organic fashion. Um, but I always had shoot days. And I think I differed from other creators in that way. So I always shot multiple looks on specific shoot days. And I always had a photographer. There was never um, a so kind of self-shoot situation. No, no selfie. No. Um, and so I was always kind of packet shooting kind of five looks in one day or whatever, yeah. which would then, um, you know, kind of feed out into the content over time. Um, and I still do that. Uh, and obviously with a busy work schedule now that involves travel and conferences and public speaking and, you know, yeah. it's, it would be impossible to just shoot what you actually were wearing. That's just not, yeah, not you know, as in you may be wearing that outfit, but certainly not on that day. Was it shot? You know? Okay. Well, that's so interesting. Cause it's, it, that's very honest. Yeah. Because... So I will recreate the outfits that maybe I've worn across that week, yeah. but they'll all be shot in one day. Um, and we'll just go to different locations. Although in this kind of way that social media is evolving now, the content that people seem to love of beer at the moment is in my own home. So that's pretty pretty low uh, travel. Well, you know, but that, well, that's good so, for yeah. the girls. So that's good. That's excellent for the um, girls. But still, yeah, I still work with um, one or two photographers that have worked with me for the best part of the last 10 years. And So that's a very easy relationship. It's a very easy so, relationship, yes, yeah. No, that definitely, that definitely um, helps. But I think it's now more than ever about a window into what feels like an authentic moment yeah an authentic life um and it's hard to create that in a way that is organized and will allow you to post five times a week but will keep that feeling do people want you to post five times a week i think people would want you to post Sometimes not at all, and sometimes every moment of the day. It depends how they feel about you. Um, so, so now, do you, you do public speaking? And I've I've forayed into lots of different things, from kind of in-house consulting for big corporations to public speaking. To... And in-house consulting consists of what is that about? Brand image? What is it? About? Everything from like literally advising on what products should make it to market, how they should be marketed, how they should be PR'd what influencers in digital content they should work with um, to kind of styling lookbooks for brands and concepting the brand's direction and finding them um, introductions into industries or into retail, um, brand ambassadorships, yeah, so enormous. internal digital kind of yeah. concepting. It, it has varied a lot. Am I right in thinking that you had a jewellery brand at one stage? I had one until I had my second yeah, child. Yeah. And then I realised that the workload was just not sustainable with the second child. So I still sometimes do custom orders for like clients who kind of have bought and bought again. Um, and I Fine just do jewelry. one offs, yeah, yeah, for them. But I And I love jewellery. It's the thing that I could kind of waste all my money on. Um, it's waste. It'll be there forever. Don't it's forget. True. As it's long as true. it's fine and it's real. Yes, it's uh, true. There's it's no true. waste involved. True, and you can always reset and re you yeah can reset reuse. And, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so I I I love jewelry and it's it's such a passion for me. But just to keep up with my normal workload and two kids, yeah. it was just not Too doable. Hard. Yeah, to do them both. So is there something that you're kind of thinking when they're a bit bigger? you want to do is a is there a, a brand you want to set up is there or, or maybe not um I have um clothing coming out at the end of the year oh. um so that'll be very exciting then yeah oh, that's very exciting yeah. 
end of this year. Yeah, but the difference is that's with another brand. So I'm not managing every moment of it, which is what the jewellery was. All oh, right. Yes, the jewellery was it. just mine. This is a collaboration when that's what I've realised since having children. I need teammates. Yes. Yeah. So does it, so will this be Peony Lim? Four. Four. Okay. Uh, exciting. So when will we hear about what when? Autumn. Excellent. Watch <laughs> this space. Um, last question. People, I mean, I, I, I do think that everyone thinks they can be an influencer or everyone thinks they can be a content creator. Well, arguably, everyone thinks they can be a jewellery designer as well. Uh, there is a bit of that too. Um, um, but what's your advice for people who want to go into want your world? Want to be world? content creators? Yeah. I used to have a kind of whole list of, you know, things about kind of authenticity and defining your space in the market and stuff. And I think now it's actually, we've gone through such a cycle of creators and it's had such a long-term effect on the mental health of predominantly women that have gone into this space and given so much um, that I think you need to ask yourself really more why you want to be a creator. Because if it genuinely is a creative outlet, there are lots of other ways to do that without the exposure that being an influencer gives you. Yeah. In, in a good and bad way um, and and if you are really set on it and you love everything about the industry and you really really think you do want to do it um, then you can only be yourself I think the key is if you love everything about the industry but I think a lot of people going into it don't necessarily know everything about the industry because I've learned a lot just from speaking to you <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people that want to go into it now tend to be younger and they tend to have absorbed a huge amount of media themselves, which makes it difficult to know what you want to be when you've seen so much. It's like, you know, if you only went into other jewellery shops and looked at everyone else's work, how would you know what, you know, of course we need creative influence, but I would say stop looking online for that influence. You know, go read a book, go to a gallery, watch a film. Yeah. find other places so that you can create something new for that space it's true to true to, to yourself. yeah because ultimately like we're all looking for a new version of the same thing on that note um thank you so much thank you for having me um Pierre, now i've got one other thing um as you know uh, as a thank you i'd like to make you one of these charms um and i wondered which one you'd like me to make Oh, I feel like it's like heartbreaking to have to choose only one. I think it's between, for me, it's between the mixtape and um, the bubble bath. They're the two that are so specifically unique, I think. Yeah, they are very to specifically. Me. Yeah, no, they absolutely are. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to make you one. So you're gonna Which do you like the one. most? No, I, it's not about me. It's all about you. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so important because the charms are there for a story. Yeah. So when your girls grow up, yeah. you want to be able to say, this is why I've got this. Because they will yeah, say, yeah, mummy, yeah. what's that about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's you need to think about that. I think because they never knew her and they won't know yes. her in this lifetime, the bubble bath. I'm going to really enjoy seeing how the bubble bath turns out because I think it'll be absolutely adorable. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating and lovely to spend some time with you. Thank you so much for having me. I've been such a huge fan of the brand, so I can't wait to see the bubble bath.